So now I'd like to take a moment and to, um, to welcome newcomers. And if there are any newcomers here that would like to, um, would like to say hello, uh, we could offer you, a, we can, we can un allow you to unmute and, uh, and you could uh, say a few words. Um, whether you feel like doing that or not, I did want to take a moment, we did want to take a moment to, to welcome you and thank you all for being with us this Sunday. But there's a person we have to especially welcome today. And that is Reverend Laureen Williams, who is our co-minister today. And uh, I'd like to, well, I'm going to read her bio. And I, I will complete by talking a little bit about my relationship with Reverend Laureen, who is um, my colleague from seminary on. We went to seminary together. Um, we met um, in October in 2011, and we've been on this path together. Um, and Reverend Laureen is an extraordinary person, and uh, it is a gift to all of us to have Laureen with us. And here is Reverend Laureen's bio. Activist, counselor, innovator, minister, yet spirited best describes Reverend Laureen Williams. She is as lively talking about spirituality as she is about her beloved Steelers. For her, there is no difference between a congregation raising its voice as one in worship and a stadium of fans raising their voice as one to uplift a player or team to victory. Both embody a consciousness of oneness, connection, and a unifying purpose and sense of community and spirit. Is it less powerful or profound because one is social and considered secular? Reverend Laureen doesn't think so. She believes the societal paragram of separation between church and state is as unnatural and impossible as separating our divinity from our humanity. The spiritual journey to practice moving through the world as holy as possible, closing the gap between our own humanity and divinity by bringing down the wall of separation between us and our own souls. Sought after for a compelling conversations, engaging inquiries, sense of humor, and unique perspective, Reverend Laureen it explores with people how to embody their personal truth in alignment with spiritual truth for greater fulfillment, delight, and peace. Oh, sorry, and peace of mind. This is accomplished through her writings, counseling, ministry, public speaking, and transformational workshops and innovative programs. Reverend Laureen Williams is also a board of the directors of One Spirit on the board of directors of One Spirit Learning Lions, is now the team lead of One Spirit in Action and was one of the ins inspirations for its birth and its growth through these last 10 years. And um, which one we most of us know One Spirit in Action is One Spirit's uh, interfaith seminaries, uh, arm of activism and service. And Laureen is also a member of Delta Sigma uh, Theta Sorority. I don't know if I pronounced that right, Laureen. Please feel free to unmute and, and correct me, uh, which is incorporated as a public service sorority. Reverend Laureen Williams is from Westbury, Long Island, where her mother still resides and is currently residing here in New Jersey in Bloomfield near us. Please join me in giving a, 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 a wonderful you, you welcome and applaud in our silence and wave your hands and welcome our dear uh, Laureen Williams. Song, thank you, Sonia. You're welcome. So, so when Sonia invited me to give this morning's sermon, I wondered what I would discuss as so many things have been on my mind. Yet more importantly, there was what spirit wanted me to discuss. And it just so happens we were in agreement on the topic of grief. Now I say that with a bit of humor because we're not always in agreement about what I should discuss. <laughs> Yet spirit is patient with me. She simply holds her ground until I can see that she knows best. The truth is I didn't want to talk about grief. I mean, who does? But it's been on my mind so much lately. 
with every news report of another mass shooting, every anti-drag bill that gets passed, each state that bans critical race theory or teachings of systemic inequality, each time there's a record-breaking climate change event that destroys life and property, the updates of Russia's invasion of Ukraine or the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the opioid epidemic, I mean, the continued increases in grocery prices amidst millions already experiencing food insecurity, the humanitarian crisis at the border, and both the symbolic and literal chokehold that has taken Black life in pub public places too often by a public servant. All of it, so much of it, leaves me with grief. Every day, we are bombarded with a loss of safety, a loss of freedom, a loss of relatedness, a loss of accountability, a loss of well being, a loss of compassion, a loss of trust, and ultimately a loss of love and understanding of our shared humanity. And often these collective losses are taken for granted, like a set of keys to our car or home that we have that have been temporarily lost or misplaced. You know, a bit of fear and panic arises at first, then a wave of chaos as we disrupt everything looking for them, followed by blame, annoyance, or anger. But at last, we believe we'll find our keys as we exclaim, I just had them a minute ago. Then we find them and what we felt what arose in that unexpected moment is put back in its place at the recesses of our minds, at least until the next time. Yet loss is always with us, just as death is nearby at all times. Is death not a breath away lurking in the recesses of our minds when we think of the inevitable death of our loved ones or ourselves? Isn't it just right there, even if we pretend it isn't? And it's not just physical death that's lurking, albeit the most essential. It's the death of the things and experiences we love, not just the people, such as jobs and careers, relationships and marriages, parenthood and singlehood, roles and positions, our reputation and others' admiration, health and well being, pets, holidays, the cer ceremonial rites of passage, such as birthdays and graduations, weddings, funerals, christenings, and retirements, the how much enjoyment we love in going on vacation or being outside in nature the homes we live in or the neighborhoods to which we belong and other life experience, experiences that we came to miss and long for when we were deep in the throes of the pandemic. We experienced loss individually and collectively as well as intimately and communally in a way that we never had before. It wasn't just within the imagined borders of America, but across the entire globe. In those hours of holy stillness, in those days of sacred silence, in those months of divine disruption, we could lo no longer ignore loss and grief as our constant companions. Yet the pandemic brought to light the illusion of stability and certainty in our lives and in our living, in our families and neighborhoods, in our society and country. A stability and certainty that once seemed 
as solid as that big block of artificial orange colored processed government cheese that's hard to cut, even with the sharpest of knives and difficult to melt, even with the hottest of heat. An illusion that seemed almost impenetrable and indestructible like that cheese. But grief makes quick work of our illusions, tossing out the indestructible nature of our beliefs, tossing around our feelings, tossing away our impenetrable attachment to certainty as it tosses aside our routines. In its aftermath, we're left feeling like a slice of Swiss cheese authentic in color, unprocessed, riddled with holes and much easier to cut. For grief cuts us to the core and we come face to face with the way of living life we inherited. From our upbringing, culture, values, experiences and society to this unfamiliar terrain of divine inheritance, the gift of life as an act of creation, not repetition, and living as an expression of our authentic self, not artificial homogeneity. We're the vessel through which life happens, the container in which life is lived. We're the vessel through which love is expressed, through which beauty is witnessed, through which compassion is experienced, through which laughter is shared, through which community is felt. And we're also the vessel through which pain is expressed, through which flaws are witnessed, through which unbelonging is experienced, through which trauma is shared through which aloneness and separation are felt. We are the creators, created, and creation of life and the world in which we live. We are a fractal of the divine simplicity and eternal elegance of I am. I am that which is expressed. I am that which is witnessed. I am that which is experienced. I am that which is shared. I am that which is felt. Ultimately, I am that I am. That is all the ways of being and behaving of our humanity that we acknowledge and appreciate and all the ways of being and behaviors of our humanity that we deny, denounce, and judge. This is our most valued possession, not what or who we collect along the way as we journey through life, but the container we are. When loss occurs, we are right in the midst of all of that. What was expressed and what wasn't, what was witnessed, and what we were unwilling or refused to see, what we experienced and what we didn't or no longer will and now won't, what was shared and what was withheld, what was felt and what we wouldn't allow ourselves to feel. Grief is the bridge that dismantles the duality of loss by replacing and for with. The conflicting, convoluted, and confronting feelings of grief offer what was expressed with what wasn't, what was witnessed with what we wouldn't or couldn't see, what we experienced with what we no longer will, what was shared with what was withheld and what was felt with what we wouldn't allow ourselves to feel. Grief restores our wholeness 
by taking off the blinders of duality for the vision of divinity. A vision that we are embodied divinity with humanity, intimately and intricately interwoven and interconnected, not separate and apart like two different aspects we must forge together, but rather two expression that we must learn to integrate into our living. The holy invitation of grief is to release the contrived compartmentalization with which we live our daily lives, to welcome the wholehearted living and authentic self-expression that is us. It is a holy W-H-O-L-L-Y invitation to bridge our humanity with the holy H-O-L-Y invitation of our divinity. It is an invitation to the all that we are with the all that life is by being alive in our living. So let's return to the beginning when I mentioned the plethora of news reports. What if that somewhat safe distance of those collective losses, which impact us significantly, yet not as intimately as those directly affected by them, served as a way to begin to feel what we've numbed, refused, ignored, or denied? What if we watch the news, not as distant bystanders, but engaged witnesses? These deposits of awareness waking us up to the breaks in our shared humanity, the breaks in our relatedness and relationships, the breaks in honoring our surroundings as mutual. And with each deposit of awareness, we break apart the created and confining boxes of skin color, sexuality, gender, age, socioeconomics, religion, and politics. We've used to separate our hearts from ourselves and each other and our souls from how we live individually and as a society. This would allow us to tap into our collective heartbreak and restore ourselves to the vessels of life and containers of living that we are. In the awareness of these collective breaks, we could start to let the pain in, let it break us up into pieces and open us to feel what's right there in the background waiting to be acknowledged, to feel the sorrow the anger, the hurt, the sadness, the blame, the remorse, the shame, and all the other feelings we relegated to the shadows. You know, that's how it happened for me. In the safe distance of tapping into the grief of the world, I was able to better become acquainted with my own personal grief that I had run from, ignored, and tried to escape. I could confront my heartbreak at the world, at life, and if I'm honest, at God, and give words to it, feel it, and express it. Then I could take those same behaviors towards the world and apply them to my own life. I could give up surviving the world and having to rise above its suffering to engage with my own world and heal my own suffering. You see, I came to know grief pretty early in life. It began with a playful moment alone with my uncle in the basement of my grandparents' house, a moment that turned into utter confusion when he touched me inappropriately. What had been a time of fun and joy had turned into a break of belonging in the blink of an eye. What had been safe, my surroundings, 
who had been safe, my family, were no longer a space or place where I felt safe. There was a loss that I had no words for and no ability to express and no capacity to integrate. Just an intensity of emotions that seemed to come all at once. This incident distorted what love had been, the love that I was deserving and worthy of, and my trust in the world as a place of wonder and delight. And over the years, as it is for many who experience loss, even if not traumatic, we cut ourselves off from the fullness of life and diminish our aliveness in living it. We cease to be a vessel and instead become a vacuum, picking up the crumbs of life we can control, sucking up only those experiences of living that feel good, comfortable, or safe but ultimately already too full with debris, with the debris of repressed and suppressed feelings that we're trying to avoid, to truly be open and available containers that we are designed to be. We are unmade by grief. It pokes holes in us, making us open. It empties us out, making us available. It unravels our lives, making them less siloed and more communal. It is the unwelcome guest that invites us to be alive. This brings to mind one of my favorite Rumi poems, The Guest House, which begins with this being human as a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house clear of its furniture. That's exactly what grief does. Sweeping away the certain, familiar and reliable in our lives like furniture in a home no matter its nature, whether grief is the form, whether grief is from the death of a loved one, end of a relationship that we cherished, loss of a job or career that fulfilled us, the betrayal in our marriage, or the way our bodies start to betray us as we age, or estrangement from family, or a major health change, or a miscarriage, or abortion, or whatever other loss comes up for us. It was allowing myself to feel my own grief, welcoming it as a guest housed within my psyche and body that I was unmade from the stories of a childhood incident, that I was able to restore my humanity to wholeness and that of my uncle and our shared humanity as family, which allowed me to begin to heal my heartbreak. Not heal what had happened because what was done was done, but to heal what I said to myself, what I believed about myself, what I thought and made up about my family. I was returned to love, which keeps no record of wrongs, does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes and always perseveres. Love never fails. And grief is the terrain that has us come to know this sacred truth deep within our bones. Thank you. If you like this video, please like us on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and click on the bell to be notified whenever we post a new video. Thank you.